let's talk about media and economics a little bit. I promise you, it's going to be, um, we're, I'll talk a little bit, and then we'll take a lot of, a lot of your questions. That'll be, you'll notice a point, you know, sort of the depths and doldrums, and then we'll rise to that higher level of the questions from the crowd. But let me, let me say a few things. And I'll begin with a simple question. Why are we still engaged in the absurd, meaningless, distracting debates about debt ceilings, austerity, and whether to cut Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security? Why in God's name in the 21st century would we be having such absolutely absurd discussions? Now, one thing, yeah, come on up. It's, we're saving a place for you right here, my dear. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep that front row open for the late arrivers. <laughs> They're all recognized as such. No, no, we're delighted you're here. Thank you. Um, no, they, so why are we in this mess? Why do we, what is this? Well, one thing is, and I know this is going to come as a shock to many of the CPE folks especially, but we appear to have a bit of a concentration of economic power problem in the United States. Um, we have... <laughs> A lot of very, very wealthy people who are not as stupid as they seem. Um, they took all the money, <laughs> and they use a little bit of it to make sure that they keep all the money. It's called campaign finance. And we have an incredibly lousy politics in America, an indefensibly awful, you just, it's criminally insane politics in America. Where, you know, we say, you know, yes, you may have the best idea, you may have the best solutions, you may not be a crook, but you cannot be elected because you didn't gather enough money from Goldman Sachs. And so, right up front, consolidation of economic power and a, the bad politics that extends from it, certainly a problem. I can acknowledge that. But I'm going to suggest that as bad a problem is our media. And you think, well, how can that be? Um, I've learned to blame the wealthy for all of my problems. I had no idea I could blame the media as well. This is rather exciting. Um, well, it's not just that the wealthy own major media, although they do. Find me a defense contractor, find me somebody doing something horrible. It's a pretty good bet they own a whole bunch of media. And, or just find me an Australian billionaire that likes to hack your cell phone. Um, <laughs> But bottom line is, it's not the best class of people that go into media ownership. We have safe seats up front, if you are interested. <laughs> Comfortable seats, I might add. No, it's good. Don't worry. It's, it's, this is so, you know, it's just like in junior high. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> the only seats left open are in the front row, you know, especially good on the side if I need to sneak out. You know. So, yeah, but this is a very... So I know that wealthy people own media, but I'm not even blaming wealthy, self-interested people like, say, Rupert Murdoch for everything that is wrong with our media. I'm going to suggest to you that the fact of the matter is our media system in this country is designed not merely to have a door open to the Rupert Murdochs or the General Electrics. It is, in fact, designed to be owned by them and no one else. We have a media system that is ideally suited for rapacious capitalism. Now, I know I'm in an academic setting, and so the word rapacious is understood. I do not have to explain it. But it's ugly and evil. It's not like the good capital. It's not like the person with the coffee shop on the corner. I'm talking about the capitalism that comes racing in and says, I don't just want some of the money. I want it all. And I don't really care what happens to you. In fact, it might even make me happy if some bad things happen to you, because then I can report on them. I especially like hurricanes and other weather developments. They're great to report on. Um, and I don't like complicated stories that actually require me to do more than the weather. And if you don't understand, if you don't believe it, this is, this is no joke. I'm not joking. You go home and watch, I swear, I will only ask you to do this once in your life. Go home and watch the local news on TV. And and what you will see, I, I swear to you, I do not care what else happened in the world. I, honestly, this is so awful. It is beyond comprehension. <laughs> Last night, I turned the TV on, right? And we had this uh, ungodly, horrible thing happen in Norway, which is it, the subject of it just, it's just unbelievable. And I mean, and of course, totally badly covered, right? A guy goes and attacks 
the center of government in one of the great social democratic countries in the world, and then goes attacks a youth camp for young socialists. And the one thing we don't discuss is the fact that there's an awful lot of people who run around constantly berating socialists. You know, wh what do you think about that? But, so that's a good story. That's a hell of a story. And then Amy Winehouse, the singer, died. Which is, I'm sorry, it's just interesting. OK, I'm interested in that. And oh, and we have a debt ceiling crisis in America. And maybe they're going to get rid of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, because Francis needs to get back to work. Um, <laughs> So we got all this stuff going on, right? So I flip on my local news last night, and I swear it's true in any town in America. They say, well, we got a lot of stuff going on tonight, but the first thing we're going to go to is to the weather. And I swear, they say, and you know what they said? It was hot. <laughs> and I, I did, they literally did like three minutes up front. It's really hot. It is so hot, right? And then and they say, and they give you all this stuff, like more than you could ever know about the word hot. <laughs> and, and then they say, I swear, you can't make this up. Then they say, and we're going to go through some news stories, and we're going to be back with a whole bunch more weather because it's really hot. <laughs> and, and you're like, wow. I can't wait for the part, because I know it well enough now. I can't wait for the part where they tell me the difference in the temperature from Northampton versus Springfield. Because <laughs> they will. You know, in Northampton, we got up to 89. It's a lot cooler in Springfield, 87. And you're like, wow, I needed that. See, I would only care if they were like, in Northampton it was 89, in Springfield it was 30. Now that I would care about. That would be what you would call news. But weather is not news. It's just telling you what you could know if you walked outside and stopped watching TV all the time. So they love the weather because it's cheap. Yeah, and it's not cheap. Can I tell you this? This is a little secret, and I swear I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Weather is created by the government. I'm not kidding. There's a National Weather Service. They go out and do all the measures. There's not a single TV station in America that goes out and does all the barometric pressure and weather stuff. They get it from the government. Corporate welfare. And so, I mean, they love weather because it's cheap to cover, it's easy to do, and they don't have to, you do nothing to cover it. It comes free, and you just put a map. Do you know those maps on TV? They don't even have anything on them. It's just a projection. There's, it's, it's nothing. It's vapid. It's like eating grass. And, and bad grass, I might add. Um, and so that's, that's what they love. That if they can reduce it to that, it's perfect. If they could just do weather for 22 minutes and give you no news at all, except maybe a murder, because murders are great. Nothing like a good murder, especially if it's like 50 miles away, but you can make people think it was in their hometown. Because, of course, Marshall McLuhan actually, Marshall McLuhan actually nailed this one. He said the future of you know, what he called electric communication, we now call it digital, but McLuhan got it all right. He said the future of it is that they're going to report a story from someplace else, but because it's visual, it's going to feel so immediate that you feel like it happened around the corner. And so that's why they love crime. Because when they report on crime, they can tell you, you know, oh, wow, there's a murder someplace. And you're scared, even though it was nowhere near where you live. And so, once again, it may be a little, mostly weather, a little bit of murder. You got, you've nailed it for a good newscast there. And so this is, the reason I bring all this up, the reason I bring all this up is that for a long time, they were embarrassed about this. Really, they were, you know, it's sort of like, well, uh, you know, we know we want to do weather and murders, but we should probably cover the government. Or, you know, we should maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what's going on with our schools or with our health care or with our, you know, our factories and our communities and our th you know, farming, things like that. We should probably cover all these things, right? They stopped doing that. They, don't, they, they, they figured it out. We don't have to do that anymore. Because if we just give them enough weather and murder, it's gonna, we'll nail it. It's going to work. And so this is what the for-profit media companies, and remember, I'm going to make a huge distinction here between for-profit media and the emerging media system that we have, which is really an alternative to what exists. But if we look at our for-profit media system in this country today, 
what they have decided is they can kick journalism to the curb. It's like, it's like we were driving around. We had journalism in the back seat. Then we put journalism in the trunk. No, we're just opening the trunk, throwing journalism by the side of the road, driving off. Because it's why do we need to drag journalism around when we can get a whole bunch of ads, give people almost nothing, and make a lot of money? And so for 20 years now, there's been a, an absolute decline in journalism within for-profit media. They actually look for economic downturns and excuses to lay off. It's a dream come true. Because if you can get rid of what is literally referred to as the dead weight, um, and that's dead weight is, let's let this gentleman, sir, you want to sit down? Come and sit, sir. There's seats up here, too, if you want. There you go. Hey, we're getting, we're getting the last of our good folks in here. Absolutely. Now we're going to make our organizers come sit down front. That's brutal. <laughs> um, now, so this is the thing. We're gonna, we got it down to a point now where it's great to get rid of journalists. Like, the fewer journalists, the better an operation is. Do you know that when media companies lay off journalists, their stock value goes up? Not kidding. It's like it's the best move you can make is get rid of the people who actually gather news. And so how many journalists and related people have newspaper companies laid off in the last three years? 32,000. We have the largest exodus of working journalists from the craft of any country in the history of the world. No country in the history of the world has seen so many working journalists leave the craft at so rapid a rate as we are seeing right now. We've had more than 150 newspapers across this country close in the last three years. And I'm not talking about little tiny newspapers. I'm talking about the daily newspapers in Seattle and in Albuquerque and in Tucson and in Kansas City, Kansas, actually a major city, no newspaper anymore. Ann Arbor, Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, a college town where presumably people can read. They, the daily newspaper closed down last year. Across this country, newspapers closing down. So not only are they culling out the ranks of journalism, right, getting rid of them, they're actually shutting them down. And we have a radical transition going on in radio. Since the 1996 Telecommunications Act, we have lost the better part of 20,000 on-air personalities across this country. You can hear Rush Limbaugh anywhere in America. But what you cannot hear on commercial radio is a local host who actually wants to cover the community because we have syndicated and culled out. Same thing happening to television. The boom thing in television right now, it's like there are people who make money coming up with great ideas. And I'll tell you, somebody got, somebody got a raise for this one. By law, same company is not supposed to own all the TV stations at the time. Well, that would be like a dictatorship. So what they do is, because that would be wrong, they figure out a way to make it work in our commercial world, which is that you have different companies own the stations, but one company does the news, and then the other company buys the news and puts it on. So you have one-size-fits-all newsroom producing the ABC affiliate do it going out with its camera doing the news. Then they sell it to the Fox affiliate. This is happening all over the country now. We're actually, instead of having competing newsrooms, we're coming down, we'll get rid of our newsroom. And you know, the only thing they do then, they hire, I swear, not making this up, when you, when you call out your newsroom, lay everybody off, you just keep two people on board. An anchor who is, you know, as good looking as Tim Carpenter or as <laughs> cute as Francis. Um, <laughs> And then you hire a weather person, because everybody likes their weather to be personalized. And that's it. So we literally have major television stations taking in full profits across this country that have cute anchor, cute weather person, that's it. No news gathering at all. Yet, yet, and you'll appreciate this, dear, they still qualify for doing their public service because they have news on every night. But they didn't produce it, they didn't gather it, and they don't ask different questions. So we're calling out of journalism. Now, our wise friends from the Center for Popular Economics might ask, well, but what does this have to do with me? Well, here's an interesting thing. When you get rid 
of tens of thousands of journalists. When you shut newsrooms across the country, you cull out the beats in places across the country. And uh, you, you know what you get rid of? Labor reporters. People who cover what working people do. Because the fact of the matter is, in contemporary media, the only time a working person is a good story, or an interesting story, is if they get in the way of a rich person. And then you have the story of how the poor person or the working person was moved out of the way of the rich person. And interestingly enough, the rich person comes out as the hero. Because they were, I was, I was bothered by crime. I was bothered by a labor union. I was bothered by somebody that didn't let me develop my waterfront property as I chose. And they were removed. And so now we have freedom and liberty in America. And this is how, this is what has happened. We have warped our entire discourse in this country, every aspect of it, because we don't cover what working Americans, the great mass of Americans, do anymore. I'll give you an example. Bob and I did research on this. In 1941, 70 years ago, Francis, you remember this. And in 1941, in the United States, we had more than 1,000 working labor journalists. More than 1,000 people got up in the morning and working for a for-profit newspaper or radio station, when our magazine went out and spent their whole day covering labor. Not covering business and how labor got in the way of business. Not covering government and how public employee unions got in the way of something. No, their job was to cover labor. They knew the name of every union in the country. They knew the names of union leaders. If a union went on strike, they didn't cover it as purely a business story. They covered it as a human story connected to a community. And amazingly enough, people were interested in labor. When did we have the greatest boom in organizing of labor unions, greatest boom in membership of labor unions? When we covered labor, when it was something real in people's lives. So 1,000, 70 years ago. You want to take a guess how many working labor reporters we now have, people identified as labor reporters for major television, radio, magazines, or newspapers in this country today? Oh, yeah. now you are so cynical. Yes, that is unbelievable. I cannot believe this poor this woman, who's such a nice looking woman, has been sitting back there going, zero. <laughs> there are seven. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We are done. We have culled out. We have culled out just about. And, you know, and the remain. You know what happens when a labor reporter dies? I swear, this is it. When a labor reporter dies, a business reporter is born. Um, because every paper that's still got like, oh, all right, we'll keep you on. We'll keep covering labor. When they go, they're never replaced. And so we have had an emptying out of labor coverage in this country, and it has a devastating impact because it makes us stupid. Now, think, well, how can losing labor reporters make us stupid? Give you a little notion. I have recently had a very interesting experience in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> I live in Wisconsin. And I know I cover politics in Washington, do all that nice stuff out there. But where I live in, in Wisconsin, um, we had an election last fall. Can I, here's a recommendation to you. And I'm just not, I make no partisan statement here whatsoever. Really, this is my counsel to you. You might want to watch out electing a right-wing Republican governor with a right-wing legislature. <laughs> this, this combination um, does not always work out well. And our Republican governor in Wisconsin came along and he, knowing full well, knowing full well that people are sick of a few things, sick and tired of a couple things. Americans are sick and tired of public education because it's making our kids too smart. You ever, ever had a smart ass kid around? You know that's a problem? Gonna get rid of public education. They're sick and tired of having their snow plowed in winter because you gotta go to work. Um, they're sick and tired of paying taxes because next thing you know you got public education and snow plows, <laughs> which we all know we wanna get rid of. And so they passed a law, or they tried to pass a law in Wisconsin, they tried to pass a law that said that public employee unions no longer have basic collective bargaining rights, 
that they couldn't collect dues, that they had to reorganize themselves every year. Can you imagine if you said to corporations, just imagine, yeah, I know he says woman saying, yes, I like where you're headed here, man. <laughs> but just imagine if you said to American corporate, let's say we say to McDonald's, sorry, here's the deal. Every year, you're going to lose all of your contracts for all your restaurants across America. All the signs come down. All the food goes back to the farm. And you've got to start it all again every January 1st. I do not think they would go for that. But this is what they were going to do to public employee unions in Wisconsin. They're going to make them leap through all these hoops and basically make them totally dysfunctional. Now, this is an interesting thing because Wisconsin is where AFSCME, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, was founded in 1932. It's also the first state in the country to have full collective bargaining rights for local uh, county state employees. It's a pretty remarkable labor history. So they're going to try to take that all apart. And the presumption was, I'm not kidding you, the presumption was no one would care. No, there would be... Yeah, oh yeah, a couple of, couple of rabble rousers would go out and unfurl a banner, you know, and maybe some phone calls would be made, emails would be sent. What they didn't really anticipate was hundreds of thousands of people in the street and tens of thousands occupying the Capitol itself for weeks on end. This surprised them. <laughs> But why were they surprised? Why were they surprised? It was because of the media. And it was because the media bought in to a lie and to spin for the better part of 30 years. When Ronald Reagan, 30 years ago this summer, when Ronald Reagan broke the Air Traffic Controllers Union back in 1981, and he got away with it. I mean, I'll be blunt with you. He got away with it because the pilots crossed the picket line. The fact of the matter is, if the pilots and everybody else had said, no way, we're not going to let this thing happen, he wouldn't have, it wouldn't have succeeded. And there's a lot of people in Central America who would be alive today. Because Ronald Reagan's success of his presidency was based on coming in strong, busting unions, and shooting out from there. Well, that's exactly what the governor of Wisconsin was trying to do. Now, the assumption was that in, over the past 30 years, America has completely outgrown unions. Unions, working class organization has become Passe. Everybody knows you don't need a union. Unions are for losers. They're for lazy people. Public employee unions? Ugh. They get, they get in their yachts, come across the lake, pick up their check for an hour of work. You know, they teach our kids to be communists, anarchists. It's unbelievable. It, it's simply no need for this. Public employee. Next thing you know, we're going to have nurses in hospitals unionized. They're going to get enough pay so that they can actually have decent hours, patient ratios. Well, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So we know that people don't like unions, right? We know they don't like unions. And this has been reinforced again and again and again. We think unions are run by thugs. They're, they get too much pay for too little. They get things like pensions. I don't even know what a pension is, but it's apparently some way that you steal money from us even after, we're working, after you're done working. And, you know, it's just unbelievable, terrible things that unions do. And we're told it constantly. I'm not kidding you. And this is not Rush Limbaugh. This is not Fox. This is across the media system, the absolute, you know, kind of derelict, useless, thuggish nature of unions. Nothing worse than a union. We all know that. It's a given that America hates unions. Now, we may hate public education more, but we, we really hate unions a lot. It's a given. So you attack a union. You might as well, there's nothing better than attacking it. Might be, you, the union is the equivalent of a blade of grass before your mother-in-law is coming over. You've got to mow that lawn, right? <laughs> mow the unions down, let's get done with them. That was the assumption they made. And the folks in New York and Washington were blown away when hundreds of thousands of Wisconsinites came out to say, we like unions, and said, we think unions are a good thing. And the amazing thing, the troubling thing, was that many of those people who came out were not members of unions. There were grandmothers out there. Why were they there? They're supposed to hate unions. There were kids out there. Why are children out there? They are supposed to hate unions. Everybody is supposed to hate unions, and yet they were out there. So the very smart people at the New York Times decided to have a pollster go out and figure out what had happened here. 
And they asked a series of questions about unions. Do you favor collective bargaining rights? Do you think that public employee unions serve a useful purpose? Do you think that people should have a right to organize? And they get the results back. And the results are, do you favor collective bargaining rights? Yeah, well, around 75, 78%. We're actually more enthusiastic. More people believe in collective bargaining rights than believe somebody landed on the moon. Um, <laughs> No, and, and, and so they're like, do you think that public employees are, you know, well, of course, everyone hates public employees because that's where all our tax money goes. Well, no, no, it happens. More people favor collective bargaining rights. I was going to try and find some analogy here, but it doesn't, it's, it's kind of a reverse one. It's like um, there are fewer people who oppose collective bargaining than believe there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Does that make sense? Somehow, bottom line is, Everybody likes collective bargaining. We all think it's a pretty good idea, and we think public employee unions should be able to do it. We're getting 55, 65, 75 percent very strong support for public employee unions. In fact, across the board, unions poll well. The big question is, do you think we need strong unions as a counterbalance to out-of-control out of rapacious corporations? You know, 60, 70, 80 percent in some places. Young people who haven't even ever seen a union think, wow, that's a great idea. <laughs> we could get together and like bargain for our pay and our pension. We could have a pension, whatever that is. Wow, that is fantastic. And so the numbers are mind blowing. And so you know what the New York Times did? They presumed there was a polling error. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. They, they, they're like, I don't know. These figures do not make sense. There's something way weird about this stuff. And then like a few days later, Time Magazine went out and they said, well, New York Times doesn't know how to poll. We'll show you how to poll. So they go out to a poll. They get even better positive numbers for unions. And they're like, how can this be? We have been telling people for 30 years that unions are passe. They mean nothing to people. People hate unions. And yet, what, what, why are these polling anomalies? And one of the pollsters explained to the media outlets, said, well, to be honest with you, we haven't really polled on unions for 30 years. So we just presumed. We presumed what the powerful were, were saying about him. What the spin doctors, what the corporate CEOs, what the right-wing politicians, we just presumed, because they got away with it. They said it on our broadcasts all the time. They said it in our papers. So we just figured that's what it was. That was reality. We didn't realize that there were hundreds of millions of Americans out there who still believed, who still kept that little candle lit every night for a trade union movement that would be powerful enough to come back and fight against rapacious corporate greed. It was a mind-blowing development. I'm not kidding. This is, and you know, you know who was blown away as much as any media person, as much as any politician? Union leaders. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I would run into union folks. And you know, you, I mean, okay, you guys, you know, because you've got to deal with something. You'd run around, you guys, and there's something walking around like, I am beloved. <laughs> I'm thinking of going out and organizing some people. Because, of course, it has an impact. When you have a constant battering and a constant denial and a constant dismissal of an entire movement, of an entire way of thinking about how to organize society, over time it has an impact. And it's not just the media that changes. It's the society itself that changes. It's the society itself that begins to accept a lie the absolute lie that would have you believe that Americans want to have a gap between rich and poor that is gaping and getting wider and wider than any country in the world. The absolute lie that, that any person who has, you know, is older than like second grade level believes that if you cut taxes for the rich, somehow that's going to make the economy grow. The absolute lie, the absolute lie that, that any barrier to a corporation doing whatever it wants is somehow a threat to a vibrant and stable economy. And the ultimate absolute lie, the absolute lie that would tell you that a civil society, a functional society, should measure its strength, should measure its ability to deliver the basic needs of human beings by something called the gross domestic Product. Well, I will admit that it is, in fact, gross. 
But the truth of the matter is, there is no more immoral measure of a society than to say that its only contribution to this planet is what it produces. The simple reality is a civil society, a functional society, takes a portion of the resources from what it produces and uses that money to make sure that every child is educated. Not a single child left behind, and I mean really no child left behind. A functional civil society takes a portion of that profit, of that product, and makes sure that no mother will ever have to hold a fundraiser so that her child can get a kidney transplant. What kind of screwed up, backward, dysfunctional country would say to someone, you don't get health care because you don't have the money to get that care? That is immoral, that is dysfunctional, and any measure that says that is appropriate is a wrong-headed measure. And a functional society, a functional civil society, takes a portion of that product, and it makes sure that every country road is plowed in winter, that if I mail a letter to my kid, no matter where she is in this country, it gets to her, because somebody who is committed to making sure that a dad can communicate with his daughter is doing the work of delivering our mail, not Federal Express or somebody who's going to make sure they can make the biggest profit out of it. There are certain things that a functional society does. It delivers mail. It educates children. It makes sure that everyone is housed. It makes sure that everyone is fed. And it makes sure that everyone has health care. That's the only measure that matters. That's the only measure that matters. And yet, and yet, and yet, for 30 years, we're told you that, the, that everything else is irrelevant. So then we get this Wisconsin experience. And I want to tell you about Wisconsin and the media for a couple minutes and then take your good question. So this is the deal. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's a, it's a lovely town. It's a little bit like Western Massachusetts, concentrated in one place. And then you throw the state government in. So um, that's cool. We, like our we, we used to like our government until the last election. Um, so we, we, in Madison, we had these uh, demonstrations. They got pretty big. Um, it started out, as it always does, not with like, the smart people and the union leaders or anybody like that. It started out with graduate students at the university. And because after the governor announced he's taken away all the labor rights, uh, the graduate student union, I mean, all the, all the big labor guys were all walking around like, oh my god, we've been you know, kicked in the head. Like all the politicians are, we can't do anything. I swear, I'm not making this up. This is so unbelievably tragic. This major, politi major Democratic political guy. I said, what are you going to do about it? They're going to destroy all the unions. And he goes, well, maybe, yeah, that's probably for sure going to happen, but maybe we could bargain with them on something like civil unions. And I'm like, <laughs> I kind of want them both. You know, I want my union. I want real unions, and I want civil <laughs> unions. I don't even want gay marriage. I'm gonna, you know, I'm not stopping there. And but I'm thinking everybody's compromised. Every, the graduate students didn't get the memo, and so they went out in the freezing cold with a little sign that said, you know, this will not pass. Handmade sign. And then a couple days later, they walked to the Capitol, and they were smart enough to recognize because they watch international news like the BBC or something, and so they knew that things were happening in the world, like Egypt. Um, and the interesting thing was that, that Scott Walker, our governor, announced that he was going to um, take away all these labor rights, take away all these you know, civil rights, uh, civil liberties, um, uh, on the day after Mubarak stepped down. Now, presumably he thought, well, there's one too few dictators in the world, and so I'm going to fill that void. <laughs> um, but so he does all this stuff, right? And the weird thing was everybody kind of got it. It's like, oh, yeah. They, did, they were out in Egypt, their interior square. That was very interesting. We could, I guess we could do that here. <laughs> and <laughs> so you'd see these people with like signs in Arabic, right? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it was not every Wisconsinite is dieting. There's a, people like a lot of cheese and stuff. So you'd see like, like grandmothers in Christmas sweaters with signs in Arabic <laughs> saying, if, if Egypt could take down Mubarak, Wisconsin can take down Walker. <laughs> and you're like, wow, that's all right. You know? But the best sign of all, by far the best sign of all, was a guy who had a big banner. He's walking around every day. It said, it says, I thought Cairo would be warmer. <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, it's a little, everybody's kind of getting the thing, and it's like, you know, and I'm thinking, this is so typical of my good state. You know, we're going to have a rip roaring time for a while before we get beaten into the ground. Um, but the people kept coming, and then about three days in, the, uh, the teachers union uh, decided that they were going to take an in-service day and do education at the Capitol rather than in school. Um, and so all the teachers went up. Now, I want to tell you, that was the point at which the big turn came, because I, I know very surprising to some of the CPE folks, but collective action by trade unions and community groups, very powerful. Little note there, you want to pay. And so when they, when they went out, when they went out, right, this is a big deal. So all the teachers are out, the schools are empty. And you would assume the parents would be furious, right? And the students would be clamoring, where is our education? Um, so I'm driving up, this kid's laughing. <laughs> that never happened. Um, so I'm driving up to my capital in Madison in my, in my you know, luxurious 1999 Ford Escort um, made by union workers in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, so I'm driving up to the capital, and I'm finding my way to the capital to be a bit delayed. This is not, I'm not having my quick route up, and you know, we have the motor car to get places. And so I'm driving, and I think, what is wrong this morning when my, all the teachers are out? Why is my street so crowded? What is the problem? Why is traffic screwed up? As I got close to the Capitol, I saw 2,000 students from our East High School had gathered in the parking lot of the school at 8 AM without any call from the unions, without any pressure. They had come on their own using Facebook and Twitter to gather and to march to the Capitol in solidarity with their teachers. Wow. And when I, got, when I got to the Capitol, Coming from the other side of town, 2,000 students from the west side of town marching in solidarity with their teachers. And then 6,000 students from the University of Wisconsin showed up in the red and white colors of our university chanting solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. And you saw this incredible moment of not just the unions, but everybody coming out on behalf of them. And here's where it got interesting. At this point, the national media decided that there was a problem <laughs> because this is not supposed to happen. Now, I want to emphasize that if you want to actually know what the news is before the, the CBS, ABC, NBC get to it, you want to listen to Amy Goodman. <laughs> because Amy Goodman had me on that Monday before any of the teachers went out, before anything happened, right? And then also, I want to give kudos to Ed Schultz, and, uh, Ed, who's on MSNBC, but also has a radio show. Ed Schultz had me on that Monday talking about what is going on in Wisconsin. But other than Amy Goodman and Ed Schultz, it's, getting, it's a little lonely out there. Wasn't, I wasn't feeling particularly pressured by the media attention to developments in Wisconsin. Suddenly, when everybody's out, the media gets very, very interested, fascinated. And the New York Times <laughs> decided that it was coming to Wisconsin. They got their passports. <laughs> they got their guidebooks, their maps that they could roll out, and they flew into Wisconsin, flyover country. And they landed at a nearby airport, crossed the border with little problem, and made their way to Madison. They arrived, and they looked at hundreds of thousands of young people, elderly, working people, small business owners, farmers who'd come in on their tractors, and they said, this is not the story. <laughs> the story must be somewhere else in Wisconsin because we're sure that outside of Madison there are people who are very angry that all the greedy public workers are out here demanding that they have collective bargaining rights and, and health care and pensions and things like that. And so I'm not making this up. The New York Times reporters rented a car and left Madison to go in search of people who didn't agree with what was happening in Madison. And several days later, they produced a story from a town called Janesville, Wisconsin. It's south of Madison, where the General Motors plant had recently closed, thank you to free trade. And so they get down to Janesville. And I, can, I was not with them, so I can only begin to to tell the story as best I can. But being the New York Times reporters that they were, they decided to go where people of a place like Janesville would gather. 
they went to a quaint little setting referred to as a tavern. <laughs> and they walked into the tavern midday looking for working people. Because, of course, where would working people be at midday <laughs> but sitting in a tavern? Of course, the logic of this is good. And they come in and they go, hello, <laughs> worker. We come from New York City, big city on coast. How are you, worker? Are you having a good day? Would you like to talk to me about being a worker? And they found one guy at the bar um, who spoke a little bit of New York. And so they were able to communicate. And, and the, the worker at the bar told them that he was, in fact, furious that public employees and their supporters had surrounded and occupied the capital of Wisconsin, and work was not getting done in Madison, and all these greedy public employees who had pensions and health care, and he had nothing. And he explained how he had worked at the GM plant and gotten laid off, and how he'd been a union worker, and done all these things, and how horrible his life was because public employees got decent pay. So, this whole storyline, now you can imagine, you can imagine how bummed out I was the next morning when I picked up the New York Times, finally taking the Wisconsin story to the front page. And there it said, Wisconsin workers disapprove of public employee demonstrations. And I'm like, wow, I had thought differently. <laughs> My impression was different. And then, but there's the New York Times. They had the whole story of this worker who really hated public employees and didn't know why they were so lazy and was against their unions. And I'm like, what a bummer. I thought we had something going here. <laughs> and, and it's big all across the front page. Then a week later, I'm sitting there reading my New York Times. And I, not on the front page, but on the second page. Down there, you know, there's a little ad that says, light your candles at 5. And then another little ad, if you have prostate problems, you know, like the little tiny ads down there. Amidst them was some, a little correction. And it said, about the story about the worker from Janesville, Wisconsin, who didn't like public employee unions. Um, we apologize first for getting his name wrong. And in fact, there is no one by that name in Janesville. We also have, in, in doing a little bit of follow-up, discovered that um, he never w did work at the GM plant or at any other factory that we could find. And when in contacting the UAW, we found out he had never been a UAW member, as was suggested in the article. <laughs> in fact, basically everything in the article was wrong. And I thought to myself, man, what a shocking thing. The New York Times did not get that story right. Um, and I thought, well, how could they have gotten it right? What could they have done? Hmm. Here's a novel notion. <laughs> they could have walked out of their hotel room in Madison, gone down to the square with the tens of thousands of people, and looked at the banners, like the one from United Auto Workers Local 95, Janesville, Wisconsin, where working and laid off workers had come every single day, private sector workers in solidarity with public sector workers. They were there from the start. You didn't have to go to Janesville to find them. They were in Madison standing with the workers there. But the New York Times didn't find that. Now, I was bummed out by this. You know, I was bummed out by a lot of the coverage. But nothing bummed me out so much as when the legislature finally did pass the governor's bill. Three weeks in after all the demonstrations, they violated open meetings law, they passed the bill. Once again, my friends at the New York Times, the next day, had an article that said, Wisconsin's struggle is over. Legislature passes the bill, governor's going to sign it, it's all done. Because, of course, if you're media in America today, and you've gotten rid of most of your reporters, you don't cover most stuff, the only thing that really matters is when an official source says something happened. Right? So when government acts, that's the end of it, because we don't have popular organizations. We don't have citizens out there doing things. They, there's government action. It's done. And the New York Times didn't actually say it in so many words, but you sort of get the footnote at the bottom. It's like, peasants, be home with you. Out of there. Go back to your work. This story is over. 
and they pulled out, and a lot of the national media pulled out. The TV cameras left. Everybody's gone because it was over, right? Because government had acted. So it didn't matter if government acted in a way that the people didn't want government to act. As my friend Laura Flanders, who does such a great job with Grit TV, said, Wisconsin was the only story in the history of the world where when more people came, it got less coverage. And, you know, like in the Middle East, every day as the crowds grew in Tahrir Square, more national and international media came. In Wisconsin, as the crowds grew, more of it left. And so the story was, it's all over, it's all done. Now, of course, I was terribly bummed out by this. I thought this was, you know, really sad. Um, but the Saturday after the New York Times had said the struggle was over, things had been settled, the fight had been lost, I decided, what the heck? It's 20 degrees, snowing. I think I'll go down south of town and hang out in a parking lot with my daughter. And so we drove down about five miles south of town. And we get to this parking lot, um, and a bunch of my farmer friends had come into town, including one of my friends from Cobb, Wisconsin, which is nowhere. And actually, it's about two miles from nowhere, but it's really close. You can see it from there. So he's from Cobb, Wisconsin. He did his chores from midnight to 3 AM, and then drove his tractor seven hours into Madison. And there were about 50 other farmers who had brought tractors in from around the state. And they decided they're going to ride on the Capitol, right? Now, of course, this is insane because they're not union members. Um, they're small business owners. Farmers own their farm. They, they must hate state government. But th these, were, these misguided souls had decided to come in solidarity with the protests at the Capitol, which were over. So we don't even know why we're there. But my daughter Whitman and I, she's seven. She wanted to ride on a tractor. It's cool. So we all get on our tractors, and we start rolling in to downtown. Now, tractors move very slowly. You know, <laughs> and so we didn't really roll fast, but after about 10 minutes, we get to the first corner, and there's like three kids out there with signs that say, thank you, farmers. And we're like, wow, that's so cool. It's so sad that this is over and we have lost, because that's such a touching scene. And so we kept rolling another like about a half mile more. And there's about 100 people out with a giant banner. And it says, farmers and workers together, solidarity. And we're like, wow, that is so cool. I am really sad that we have lost, because it's all over, that this is completely defeated. <laughs> and, and so we're driving along, coming along the road. And as I said, I think I mentioned that tractors don't move very fast. And so cars started coming along. Not a few cars, a lot of cars, hundreds of cars, forming like a barrier around the tractors for this whole like, fi line of 50 tractors and then hundreds of cars around. And Wisconsinites, I love Wisconsin, but we're not the quickest people in the world. It took us three weeks to figure this out. But they had figured out that you can beep on your horn the rhythm of this is what democracy looks like. So they're all coming along going beep, 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 beep. And we're rolling along in our tractors feeling a little bit honored. You know, and my daughter's waving, and everybody's out there. And we're coming through the snow and the cold and all this. And, and, I, and again, I had this thought, you know, I'm thinking, what a bummer that we have lost, that it's all over, that, that, that this is done, that we're just wasting our time here. And we rolled around the corner with all the cars, beep, 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 and the tractors and everything. And we come up the, the hill, and it's starting to snow really hard, and it's very, very cold. And we're coming toward that great capital in downtown Madison. And as we roll into the square, we are greeted by 150,000 people who don't read the New York Times. <laughs> and nothing was over. Nothing was over. And the lesson that I would take away from, get, have you take away from all this is, we have a horrible media system in this country. Our commercial media system is a dysfunctional, dying system. It's laying off reporters at, at unprecedented rates. It's shutting down any piece of media it can purely to pursue profit. Gives you weather, a little bit of crime, but nothing on your real lives. But something else is out there happening in America. And the next media system, the next media system is the most important thing you can be engaged with. CPE, you should be training 1,000 communicators to join into this next media system. Don't try and catch up with the old one, because if to do it, you've got to go off the cliff with them. Let them go and look for the future. Because I'll tell you one final story from Wisconsin. About three weeks into the struggle, uh, I'm at home and it's a Saturday. And this was a Saturday where we weren't going to do a lot of stuff that day. 
You know, it's maybe a little demonstration up at the Capitol, but not a lot of things going on. I was going to do some laundry because some of my friends had started to note that they knew I was coming even when they didn't see me. It was time to do laundry. It was time to take a shower. It was time to shave. We were taking a day off. And so the phone rings. At, oh, no, sorry, I apologize. I got up, I got up about 7 in the morning, and um, there's an uh, um, email. And it's from my friend Michael Moore. And Michael had emailed saying, I'm coming to Madison today. <laughs> and I'm like, but there's nothing happening today. And so he says, I'm coming. I was watching Bill O'Reilly last night. Now, I thought I had told him not to watch Bill O'Reilly anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> so he's watching Bill O'Reilly, and Sarah Palin was on. And they were trashing Michael Moore on the show. And they were saying, well, you know, all these people in Madison, they're just out there because Michael Moore told them to go out there. And he said, I thought, well, geez, if I'm, the, if I'm responsible, I should really go. <laughs> I'm not making this up. So Michael says, so I called my, my buddy. We, got, we, looked on, we looked on, like, you know, Expedia or wherever. We found a cheap ticket. We're flying into Madison. We're getting there at noon. And I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, like the most, one of the most famous people on the left in America, a huge movie maker. All this stuff is coming to Madison. And we have had all this stuff coming, but there's not really a lot happening today. And we don't have the old media to tell people about it because it's Saturday morning and you can't get the TV thing going or the radio thing or the newspaper's already been published. What, what, what are we going to do? And so this is about creating a, a new generation of educators. And, and I, I called my friend's teacher. Uh, or I, I'm sorry, I called my daughter's teacher. Whitman is seven. She's in, sec in first grade, going into second called Susan Stern. And I said, Susan, Michael Moore is coming. <laughs> and she was not, unlike me, old media, crotchety, useless. She, she was not like, oh no, what do we do? She was like, OK, I'll Facebook it right away, and I'll get it out on Twitter. And I'm like, wow, that sounds so technical. That's very cool. <laughs> like, All right. You know? and, and then I called my friend Ed Sedlowski, Jr. If you're an old trade unionist, you know his dad was one of the great steel workers in the 70s. And his dad was a pretty smart guy. He said, you know, if we keep doing these free trade deals, right, and all this other economic policy, the way we're doing it, we're not going to have any industrial jobs in America. All the other union people said, oh, you're silly. That could never happen. And, but the kid, Ed Sedlowski, Jr., works in Madison. He's an AFSCME organizer. I called that up. I said, Ed, hey, Michael Moore's coming. And he's going, uh, he uttered a word that in French means uh, ma it's married uh, in French. Um, and, and he said, he said, all right, I'll call, I'll call the firefighters. And I'm like, cool, call the firefighters. That's good. So <laughs> and then like the Greens were having a little rally up at the a little cute little rally. And um, so we, I called up the Greens and I said, hey, guys. This is a very, it is greens and a coalition of community groups. It's like neighbor to neighbor you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, and I call them up and I said, I said, you know that rally you're organizing where you're kind of expecting maybe 50, 100 people? Um, Michael Moore's going to speak at it. And they're like, Mayor. Um, and, and so there we go. So Michael Moore arrives, and I have no idea what's going to happen, right? I just got this Facebook, the Twitter. You know, all that, all that stuff with your phone is going on, right? And no TV, no radio, no newspaper, none of the old media that we've all thought was such a big deal. So Michael Moore gets to the airport, say, hey, Michael, don't know what's going to happen today. Uh, it's snowing very hard. It's incredibly cold. Um, but what the heck, let's go for it. And so we get in the car. We drive downtown. We pull up behind. Fire station number one in downtown. We go in the back door, and the head of our firefighters union, the head of our teachers union was there, and they had tried to find a hat big enough for Michael, um, <laughs> which they kind of didn't fit real well, but it was cool. He's cool with hats. So then we come around, and we're like, yeah, you know, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it could be. It's been pretty exciting here. And we throw the door of the fire station open, and there standing in front of it are 6,000 teachers and firefighters in full formation, firefighters in uniform, 20 bagpipers ready to take Michael Moore to the Capitol.
And I'm like, we may not need the old media anymore. And so then we come marching out, right? The bagpipers start going, and we march around the back of the, uh, it's a, like a theater in there, and we come onto State Street, which is the big street going up toward the Capitol. And as we come around, right, we're going around, there's like, and Michael Moore's marching in the front with all the firefighters and everything. Suddenly, um, well, there's 50,000 people. People had been driving to Milwaukee. They had been going you know, out to the country. They were going all over. They were out in the country. They got the Twitter. They got the Facebook. They, got, they saw it on Facebook. They got the email. People literally turned around and said, well, Michael Moore is going to be in Madison. I'm going. So here we come around the square <laughs> in downtown Madison with 50,000 cheering people. And we come up, and Michael Moore gave a speech that I think is probably the most important speech, I, with all due respect to Barack Obama, um, <laughs> or John Boehner. Uh, I think it's the most important speech given this year. Because he got up there in front of these 50,000 people, who had all come because they had just gotten a message that day through a wholly different media system than anything we've Canada. And he said, he said, I want to say something that you haven't heard yet. America is not broke. America is the wealthiest country in the world. We have the wealthiest corporations in the world. We have the wealthiest millionaires and billionaires in the world. We are not broke. We just have a broken set of priorities in this country. And then he proceeded to give one of the great popular education speeches, popular economic speeches, I've ever heard. It was all economics. There was no middle ground. There was no, oh, by the way, I make movies. No, this was pure and straight economics. He's reading reports, probably produced by you folks. And, and he's going through it, how many how the wealth has been concentrated, and going through the whole bit. And, and he's looking, and all these people, right, are taking it in as if it's candy. Because people need to hear the truth. They need to hear a popular economic truth. And when they do, it doesn't bore them. It excites them. Because Michael Moore didn't say, oh, we've got a GDP and a, you know, a Dow Jones, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. He said, there are rich people in this country. If we tax them appropriately, we're going to have enough money to do everything we need right. to do. Really? But then he said something that's really wonderful, and it was the most best part of the speech. He said, I made this movie, Capitalism, a Love Story. And if you remember, I don't know, has everybody seen it? If you haven't, you really should. There's people, anybody who hasn't seen it, I, I highly recommend. Capitalism, a love story is the story of the, uh, the economic coup d'etat, where they took $4 trillion in our resources and via the Federal Reserve distributed it to big banks and multinational corporations. First they gave $800 million to the big banks, and then when the big banks didn't lend any money, then they started giving huge amounts of money to the multinational corporations. Uh, Bernie Sanders has revealed with his Fed audit that um, we actually, at the same time we were bombing Libya, we were giving money to, for, out of our taxpayer dollars, to the Bank of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi's bank, so that he could build better bomb shelters. And, and so the fact of the matter is, we were spreading our money around like crazy to any bank, any multinational corporation in the world, not, at the same time we we're saying that we're broke here at home. And so Michael did this incredible film about it. But the most powerful thing in the film was the end of it, because most of Michael Moore's films are funny. The end of Capitalism, A Love Story is not funny. There's nothing funny or even happy about it. Michael Moore goes down to Wall Street, and he puts out the, the crime scene tape. And he's there with his bullhorn. He says, I'm here to make a citizen's arrest. We want our money back. But he was standing all alone. There was no one there. Just him. And he was pushed away from the door, and they shut the door, and that was that. So he's standing all alone. And then he does this soliloquy, which, if you, again, if you saw the film, go back and look at this last thing. He said, he said at the end that I can't do this anymore. I can't do it on my own anymore. I've been talking about this now for 20 years. I talked about you know, how they took all the jobs from Flint. And I've talked about you know, all the other things, you know, all these economic and health care issues. And it, I know you come and see the movie, but I want to say something to you people sitting in the theater. You've got to get out of those seats and come do something. Because unless we organize a mass of people to push back, and unless we push back with everything we've got, they're going to take everything we've got. That's the end of the movie. It, it closes on that note. And Michael recalled that.
And then as he's standing in front of these 50,000 people, called to the streets, not through months of organizing, but that morning via new digital technologies that free us from the old media constraints that have held us back so much. As he spoke to those people, he said, I didn't know if we were ever going to fight back. I didn't know if we were ever going to push back until now. And those 50,000 people roared with applause because there is nothing, nothing more exciting. And there is no better news story, no better news story than the story of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans saying, this is our country. It is not broke. It has broken priorities. And we have come to take it back from those who have stolen it from us and to replace their priorities with our priorities. That is a story that will not be told by major media, by commercial media in this country. It is a story that Amy Goodman tries to tell. It's a story that Laura Flanders tries to tell. It's a story that, to his immense credit, even working in commercial, an Ed Schultz or even a Rachel Maddow from out in this neighborhood tries to tell. But most of our commercial media won't tell us. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Because the 21st century is not going to belong to commercial media. The 21st century is going to belong to digital media that we create, that we use to educate, that we use to transform this country. And it will be our media, not theirs. Thank you very much. All right, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to take questions. Glad to take as many as you want, but I promise you, I pledge you that we will get you out of here by around 9 o'clock, as we promised. Yes? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, you mentioned Michael Moore being alone on Wall Street. Well, about uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, I was down there with Patty Healy, who you mentioned, Tim Carpenter, who you mentioned, and about eight or 900 other nurses and supporters. We weren't alone on Wall Street, but we were on Wall Street, mm -hmm. right across from the uh, stock exchange. And the message that everyone had was, heal America, tax Wall Street. And that's part of the national campaign, as you know, that the national nurses are organizing. But why I mention that here, not just that that was interesting, and not just that uh, Laura Flanders was there to cut, you know, and, and uh, some of our good people were there. I don't know if the New York Times was there. I don't, I don't think so. But that the best video out of that was produced by a Hampshire College student, Will, who came down on the bus with us, who just happened to bring his equipment with him, and who interviewed Patty, and interviewed Tim, and interviewed John Dunnett from Mass Senior Action Council, and uh, interviewed uh, a nurse, another nurse from Greenfield, Donna Stern, who's also involved with the MA and PDA. Uh, and put it up the next day on Amherst Media, which is local. It, it used to be ACTV, mm -hmm. cable access, but it's gone beyond cable access, right? Because now you have the internet. He had it up, and then the next day, it's up on the nurse's website on the home page. And people are talking about it, and they're linking to it, and it was awesome. Uh, so, so that's worth mentioning, but I also want to mention that we have people here who are doing good media, good local media. You have Daria Fisk, who has two radio programs, one at UMass Amherst, WMUA, that she's done for years with workers. It's part of a program where you get, uh, you know, AFSCME members and uh, and uh, secretaries. That one, what's the other one? Uh, the other one is hosted by. It's also Daria Fisk. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we'll come back to that. We'll we got to get to other questions. Yeah, yeah, but, but up in Greenfield, and then you have Ed here, and then you have Francis. Uh, Ed Russell here is doing the doing it today. Francis Crow, who when Amy Goodman couldn't be here, because why? <laughs> because WFCR said she couldn't be on. Francis not only organized a campaign to get her on WMUA and other places, but she put up a damn transmitter in her backyard. <laughs> <just started playing. laughs> oh yeah, I do want to. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, tell them where it is. Come on. WMUA. Focus. All right, there you go. Very good. I'm going to take this young woman up. Say it loud so people can hear you. And I read New York Times. So do I hear <laughs> but I was a producer and did a financial literacy show on WBAI for the last 15 years. Um, and I'm concerned about the point of view of the unpaid media. Um, I did taxes for a living, and I specialize in writers and artists. And the living of freelance writers has collapsed. Yeah. So my question to you is, is those labor writers were paid Mm -hmm. uh, Full-time nation writers are paid, mm -hmm. and the rest of us give money to the nation associates, so the rest Thank of you, you. <laughs> so you can get some money. But my question is, in this romantic notion of the unpaid media, mm -hmm. who's going to fund these people to pay their rent? Thank you. <laughs> we wrote a book about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I promise you, I didn't set this what a woman up. Uh, uh, our argument, Bob McChesney and I, in our, in our new book about all of these issues, the death and life of American journalism, which is just out in paper and makes a fine holiday gift. Um, <laughs> uh, what we talk about, a fine Labor Day gift. Well, is there any better holiday? Uh, he said a Labor Day gift. Day. Yeah, we already lost that one. <laughs> but but uh, one of the things that we argue in our book is exactly what you say. That, that this is, and this gets so critical because I, I love what's happening with digital media. I love what unions are doing. I love that uh, unions are starting to get a little teeny bit smart. And that is, that's a big statement. They're getting a little teeny bit smart and they're actually hiring people to do journalism. Not hiring people to just spout the, what has been you know, said by the leader of the union, but which can be very good but to actually go out and do serious journalism. And that is one of the places where we begin to fill the void, is that we, we are starting to say to, to groups and institutions that you can do journalism. It doesn't just have to be from the New York Times. In fact, here's an interesting thing. I, don't, I'm, I may bash the New York Times a little bit on this day. I think Times does a far better job than most. I'm a big defender. Most, doesn't do, most don't do anything. They don't even get the story wrong. And, and so what, what is very important is, though, that when we have an era of such grotesque commercialization of our media, where so many of our media outlets are literally just entertainment, where they're literally just giving us weather and crime, I guarantee you, you're going to get as responsible or more responsible journalism done by a union that's hiring people to go out and cover the community, by a uh, local community group that's going out to do it, by a local radio station, whatever we've got can do it. So our institutions need to step up. Instead of complaining about how major media doesn't cover you, start creating major media. That's, that's number one answer. But there's a second answer here, too. That's hard. And that works pretty well for middle class and upper class communities. Doesn't work real well for the poorest communities, because creating your own media, when you have to take care of your kids, when you have to find a way to do your three jobs when you got to try and find a way to get around when they're shutting down our public transportation. You don't have a lot of time to go out and create your own media. And you don't have a lot of resources because your neighbors are in the same situation. And so we have to get serious about seeing media in a different way. And the way to do that is to understand that journalism is not a commercial endeavor. It never was supposed to be a commercial endeavor. It is supposed to be, it is a public good. We need journalism to know what's going on in our society. If we don't have the stories of our lives covered, how can we go out and intervene to make our lives better? This is a critical thing because government, government relies right, on input from the people. But if the people are not informed, what happens? Government then creates its own reality. And the powerful forces that control government create a reality. And we become in the absence of journalism, a propaganda state. Now, I want to emphasize to you, I don't say that casually. The Pew Center just did a wonderful study, about a year ago, actually, in Baltimore, Maryland. And what they did was they, they quantified every way that we communicate, every, that we get news. 
And so they looked at the newspaper, all the radio stations, all the television stations, all the cable. They looked at online news sites. They even looked at the police department's Twitter feed. Because when the police department arrested somebody, they'd send out tweets, right? So they looked at every way that people get news. Here's what they came away with. And this is a critical thing about the public good. In Baltimore, which used to have a number of daily newspapers, it's now got one daily newspaper with the Baltimore Sun. The Baltimore Sun still presents the overwhelming majority of the news. The overwhelming majority of the news still coming out of the Baltimore Sun newsroom. You may have seen it portrayed in The Wire. And so th that's where it comes from. But here's the interesting thing. Pew study, they went back 20 years. They did a longitudinal study. Baltimore Sun is producing 33% fewer stories than they did 10 years ago, 73% fewer stories than they did 20 years ago. So while the Baltimore Sun, the newspaper, is still producing the vast majority of news stories in the town, it's producing a lot less. And you think, well, that's OK. We got this whole digital thing going on. So they quantified breaking news stories, actual news, something that, that is information you might in some way be interested in that's something I've seen. In their quantification, 96% of the stories in Baltimore that were news, that came in, that anyway kind of broke beyond something that was already known, were produced by old media, newspaper, radio, television. So 96% coming from old media, only 4% from new media. And, and remember that old media is producing dramatically less. So you've got a void opening up, right? There's, there's not. It's still the old media producing new media because it doesn't have the resources, not filling the void. And um, you know, we're just not getting as much. So where, then they did the best thing of all, the most important part of the study. They said, well, where, you know, what is the source of what we call news stories? And there's two ways that you get a story in, in our media. One way, one way, is um, this woman right here says, I live in a neighborhood where there's a fundamental problem. Uh, we've got a toxic, I, we think it's toxic waste or something because the kids are getting sick, uh, people just aren't doing very well. And I've called the mayor, I've called the city council, nothing happens. We gotta get this story out, we gotta do something. So she goes to journalist here, Mr. Journalist. And Mr. Journalist in his campus progress shirt, um, he, he's, uh, he's, a real, he's working as a journalist, he gets paid to do it. He gets up in the morning to be a journalist, he gets paid and he also has training, and he's got a little bit of background, he knows how to do it. He even puts a suit and tie on when he goes down to talk to the mayor. And so he digs in the story, he does research, he uses the resources of his institutions to go out and speak truth to power. He brings your truth to power. That's one way the story gets in. The other way the story gets in is power speaks its truth to us. That's a press release, it's a press conference, it's power shaping the dialogue, power deciding what a news story is. So in the Pew study, they quantified in Baltimore, Maryland, it's typical of any city, what the sources of news were. 14% of stories came speaking truth to power. 86% of the stories they quantified came from a press release, from a press conference by a powerful person, from a government or a corporate person speaking its truth to us, shaping our dialogue. 86% to 14%. You know, when I saw that study, I thought to myself, you know, this can't, this, but boy, too bad for Baltimore. But in fact, in our research, we found that in 1960 in the United States, we had one public relations person for every one journalist. In 1980, we had 1.2 public relations people for every one journalist. We could still hold them off. Today, we have four public relations people for every one journalist in America, a four to one ratio, very similar to that 86-14 in Boston. The fact of the matter is, we do have a void opening up as old media dies. That void is being filled by spin, mostly corporate spin, and it is dominating and defining our discourse. And if Orwell came back, if, if George Orwell came back today, he would say, what a fool I was. I wrote 1984. I said the really scary thing is Big Brother is watching you. I didn't realize. The truly scary thing is you are watching Big Brother. 24-7 newscast, all the sense of media, but all of it controlled, all of it spun by the powerful. That is a propaganda state. There's no other way to say it. And when you, when you present that reality to people, 
there needs to be an intervention. The intervention that we have to have, and it's not easy, oh, I wish I could give you an easy solution. I love all the digital stuff. The fact of the matter is, digital media is not working without resources. Sometimes institutions, unions, and other groups and, and uh, community groups can come in and fill some of that void. But the fact of the matter is, we ought to fill most of that void with our public resources. We, the people, should be financing journalism. And you're like, oh, hold it. Uh, red flag. Red flag. Government controlled media. It's just like Stalin. You know, it's a, it's a totalitarian state. Can't have that. Because we know that. Well, let me, let me invite you to reality. If you study the world, uh, almost every country in the world has major subsidy of its media. Almost every country that is more democratic, small d democratic than the United States, has major subsidy of its media. Um, to give you a comparison, the country of Slovenia, its ratio, they do 76% or 76 times as much subsidy per person of media as we do. Uh, across Europe, dramatically higher levels, every country. And you think, well, I, that's, I think I know what's going on there. You know, they are all totalitarian dictatorships. We just don't know it. You know, Germany, Sweden, Norway, France, Canada, totalitarian nightmare states, except if you read The Economist, right? Here's the interesting thing. In The Economist magazine, they do a uh, democracy index. They look around the world. They say, well, what are the freest countries in the world? And do you know what the freest countries in the world are? Norway, Sweden, Germany, Canada, the countries with the most highly subsidized public and community media. The simple fact of the matter is that there, we don't have to come up with some radical new fix for our problem. What we have to have is a political will to say that in this country, if people are not informed, we are not a functioning democratic state. And if we are not a functioning democratic state, we have broken faith with the founding tradition, whatever good founding tradition we had in this country. And so you think, well, the founders, they could not have believed in something so crazy as subsidization, subsidies for media. That's, that's nuts. That, you know, that's, that's a French idea if ever I heard one. <laughs> except, except that in the United States from 1787 until the 1860s, the primary source of funding for media, which is basically weekly newspapers and daily newspapers, was public subsidy. The United States, the biggest expenditure of the United States government, the biggest domestic expenditure of the United States government in the first decades of this country's existence was the Postal Service. The Postal Service delivered newspapers for free or incredibly limited cost. And what that meant was, along with the actual direct subsidies, the State Department subsidized newspapers in every state in the country so that there would be international news, so people, citizens would know about what was happening in the world because you couldn't be a citizen of a democratic state if you didn't know what was going on around the world. And so this combination of subsidies, we calculated in our book, well, what would the equivalent amount of money going to public media and going to private media but doing a public service, what would the equivalent amount of money be? It would be about $35 billion. That's the equivalent of what they did in the founding years of this republic. Today, we spend about $400 million on public television, public radio, community. It's a stunning, we have created a stunning gap. We are out of sync with every country in the world. And I know it's not easy. I know in the face of them telling you you're broke and there's nothing possible that, you know, to say well, we have to really start getting serious about public subsidy for media. But I have to tell you, we do. That's the, that is a core answer. Now, first step is unions, other groups stepping up and doing, providing resources. But ultimately, where we have to go to is there has to be subsidy. If there is not subsidy, you are, you are going to forever be doing taxes of freelance workers who are going to make less and less and less because as our newspapers, radio stations, television stations lay off more people, we're going to have more brilliantly talented people trying to make do as freelancers. And in doing a tour for our book, we would run in, our place would be packed with journalists. We'd run into people you know, who are freelance journalists. They'd say, well, I had a pretty good life going 10 years ago as a freelance journalist. But now I've got to compete with the editors I used to sell stories to because they've all been laid off. We cannot, we cannot do this without public subsidy. It is the simple reality. To say anything else is a lie, an absolute lie. And there are easy ways to begin. First off, supercharging funding for public and community broadcasting. Second, 
using our high schools and our colleges, which have existing broadcast outlets, as vehicles to stream money in through an educational route so that they can not only teach students to be journalists, but also to take unemployed journalists from the community, bring them into that school setting, burst the walls of your school so you don't just cover inside what the principal said, but send people out into the community and start covering your communities. In many parts of this country, the poorest areas of this country, the last existing media outlet is a high school radio station or a high school newspaper. Stop lying to yourself. That can be the future of media, but the only way that's going to happen is if we begin to move educational resources in that direction. And our friend Michael Moore, I've mentioned recently, Michael Moore has started what he calls the High School Newspaper Project for that exact reason, to start emphasizing that kids in school can go out and cover not just what happened at the game on Friday night, but also why there's poverty in our community. So there are, there's routes out, they're not easy, but I want you to have a lot of journalist taxes to do and I want them to be making a lot of money. Take this gentleman here. I know, Ward. It's good to see you. Good to see you. When I started out in my fellow politics, who was this fellow Walker? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> tell us what's the way out. All right. It's a huge gap from fellow politics to Walker. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Ward Morehouse, one of the great <coughs> thinkers on corporate power in America and a real hero. Yeah. It's the problem of coming to Western Massachusetts. The audience is more prestigious than the speaker. <laughs> but, um, and they're kind enough to let you answer questions. Uh, let me bring you back around because it does relate to some of these media issues. Um, you know, look. We have a problem in America that is severe, and that is that our political class has become not a, not a class of brilliant men and women rising on the, the basis of their merit, their intellect, their, their ability to speak, their ability to, to take our concerns and make them the concerns of the nation, but rather a servant class that, is, that their job is to answer the question, or answer the, the word jump with how high. And we have a servant class of political figures in both parties. And, and I want to emphasize that, that when I watch uh, our Democrats in Washington say to the question of, well, should we start to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? And some of them say, well, yeah, we've got to put that on the table. I mean, you know, why not just blow the table up, right? Because that's not an answer. That, that is. That is that is the end of a political fight, right? That's just the servants sitting around saying, well, do you want to go get a drink for him or should I? Because it's, at the end, it's serving a master class, a corporate master class, and it doesn't work. It is a dysfunctional thing. Scott Walker is the best servant uh, around, although he's got plenty of competition. And, and I want to emphasize, we just did a big uh, thing at The Nation on the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC. Alec trains legislators to uh, become really good servants of corporate America. And uh, Alec is an organization, there are 2,000 state legislators who are members of it and 300 corporations. The legislators pay 50 bucks a piece to be members, they're very conservative. The corporations pay between 7,000 and 25,000 to be members. It's a little bit like ladies' night at the bar. Ladies get in free, but the gentlemen have to pay. Um, the legislators, the legislators are the attractive folks that the corporations want to meet. They pay a lot more, and then they write model legislation, right? They, they're essentially trained to be servants of corporate capital. Scott Walker is an ALEC alumni. John Kasich in Ohio is an ALEC alumni. Of all these new governors we're talking about around the country, 10 of the current Republican governors are ALEC alumni. You know who else is an ALEC alumni? John Boehner. Eric Cantor, and the lovely Michelle Bachman. Um, and so what I want to emphasize to you, what I want to emphasize to you is that this is the crisis. It's not just in one party, it is in two parties. But the reality is that we have created a corporate servant class in our political life. And you cannot break that in the current media system. Because the current media system lives on this reality. You know, the Citizens United ruling we had back in January of last year. 
Citizens United ruling says corporations can spend whatever they want to buy elections. You know what the reality is? The reality is that just as television stations are actually declining, there's people are saying, I'm sorry, I just don't want to watch Celebrity Island, you know, face off again, <laughs> right? People are actually turning away from commercial television, and yet commercial television this coming year is going to make more money than ever. Why? Political ads. Because, and I, I'm not going to cast any aspersions because we have this wonderful mix of people, young and old, but those of you with white hair still watch television. And you also do something else, you vote. And so the, the political class loves TV ads. They spend a fortune on TV ads. They're going to spend more than ever. This coming election year, by our estimate, will, be, will cost between five and eight billion dollars. And they are not paying, the corporations are not going to pay that kind of money to get somebody that stands up to them. So we have a huge crisis in this country. And the only thing I'd emphasize is we cannot delink the media crisis from the campaign finance crisis. If we do, we're totally unrealistic. But we also cannot answer the media and campaign finance crisis simply by saying, oh, let's pass a bill. Or let's do a petition. Those are wonderful things. I'm all for it. But the truth is, the reason Wisconsin mattered, the reason what's happened in Ohio has mattered, the reason what's happened in Maine has mattered, the reason what's happened here in Massachusetts, where CPE economists were in the Capitol testifying, the reason what's happened all over the country this winter and spring matters is because people have recognized that we still have what the founders left us as our most essential tool. When you have a political class that has ceased to serve the people, you have a right to assemble and petition for the redress of grievances. They knew exactly what they meant. That is putting hundreds of thousands of people in the street and going in and banging on the doors of the Capitol, occupying the Capitol, if you must, and demanding that public servants serve the people. And if that's what we have to do to change our politics, then we better do it. Gentlemen in the back. How do we protect access to your digital media? That's a very good question. And we will close us off with that. And then a quick, Tim, what's your question to you? All right, I'll, I'll take a quick question to Tim, and then we'll get us out of here. Uh, yeah. No, don't thank me. Now, let me, take, let me do digital media, and I'll let you say those nice things about me. Um, and I'll take, I'll take, I'll take two more. Well, what's your, what, throw me in, in your question. I'm going to tell them about that in a second. Okay. Thank you. That's very good. Thank you. And um, so let me first off, protect digital media. Go to freepress.org. Net. It used to be org and net. Now we're just doing net. Freepress.net. Save the internet. Um, it is an ongoing national campaign. And it's not the only answer to saving the internet, but it is absolutely essential. And you've got to be with other people fighting on that. And I want to tell you something. This battle for the future of digital media is the most important media battle of this moment, even though I've always beat up free press to, to do more on journalism and other issues. Because the fact of the matter is, if we do not maintain the openness of the internet and make sure that it's not subdivided in the same way that cable was, in the same way, frankly, every new platform, uh, very wealthy people come out and they figure out how to make a lot of money off it. The weird thing is, the internet is easier to figure that out than a lot of the old media. And you think, well, you know, I thought it went everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's all blah, blah, blah. Now, if you can become the provider, right, that you're the internet provider for a million people, I don't charge you a lot of money to get your internet service. What I do is I then go to corporations, and I charge them to get to you. And what they ask me to do is to make sure that you don't get the media that doesn't serve them. And that's, it's an ingenious system. If we allow a, any kind of diminishing of net neutrality, that's what will happen. And we'll end up in a situation where when you Google like um, healthy food for kids, you'll get like Twix bar, right? And it'll be, when you Google great place to shop for good American made products, you'll get Walmart. Because it'll just, it will become the reality. It's so easy to do. And, and so that's the battle we're in. Obviously, people understand that. Again, freepress.net, freepress.net, save the internet. Um, check it out. Get engaged, because it really is a critical battle. Now, um, keep it on Wisconsin for a sec. Tim, closing comment, and then. 
Sweet. We got, we're like two minutes over. I swear we're finishing. Let me be quick. John, for a lot of folks say a lot Stand of Stand up and say a lot too so people can hear you. A lot of overwhelming material today, a lot of stuff to leave with. I'm asking you if you could just share with us when you have an hour or two to read, other than the beat, what blogs, what reading do you recommend to folks on a daily basis? All right. Good. Lake TV. Lake TV is very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what's that? Pacifica. Pacifica, which I do pretty much five times a day. Um, and, and all the great Pacifica stations, but also, uh, I bet CPE has a, has a net, internet site you can go to. And what's that? It's www.popularecognomics.org. Okay. Working in these times. In labor. Yeah. Now, let me, yeah. let me just circle around here and say this. If you're going to consume media in the 21st century in America, First thing you gotta do is read a foreign media outlet that covers America. That's bottom line because they cover us with more open eyes than we cover ourselves. I choose, and I'm not saying it's the only one, I choose The Guardian um, from Great Britain because I think they're very thorough and they're very, very aggressive. And I think that their coverage, while I don't always agree with it, is very, very good. I also like The Independent from Great Britain. I like them because I'm stupid and don't speak a lot of foreign languages. And so, as a result, they're in English. It's very helpful to me. I also think that Der Spiegel uh, from Germany is very good for just an international coverage of what we do here at home. I think you gotta listen to Amy Goodman every morning and uh, you're gonna get a lot of great information there. I also would recommend that then once you start moving out into consuming other media, um, as much as I sometimes am critical of the New York Times, I think you read the New York Times to find out what major media is doing, you know, what it is, and, and frankly, a better major media than most. So I do read the New York Times all the time. And the final thing, the final place where I go, in addition to the nation's website, which I think is exemplary, also makes a fine holiday gift or whatever. But um, I, I have found, I have found recently that I go a lot, and, I'm, and I've been very, very impressed by In These Times Slave Coverage, uh, which I think is terrific and very economic, and also the Progressive Magazine, which has really been doing a lot and, and is really stepping up its, its internet presence, and it's quite good. So do all that. You'll do very, very good. And finally, how can you help Wisconsin? Very quickly. Um, we're going to do something amazing in Wisconsin in the next month. And this is something that's almost never happened uh, in the modern history of the United States. Um, we are going to, on our schedule, not theirs, seize back a house of state government and introduce a check and balance on a radical right-wing governor. And. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that by recalling six Republican state senators uh, in one of the most remarkable grassroots campaigns in the history of the Republic. Tens of thousands of Wisconsinites have gone out, gathered petition signatures, and forced Republican senators who voted with our governor against labor rights, against community rights, against public education to face a new election. Recall elections are really cool. Recall elections are the electoral equivalent of impeachment. And just as we should have impeached Dick Cheney and George Bush, um, we, will, we will recall a number of Republican state senators in Wisconsin. If three seats switch, three sweet seats switch in August, on August 9th, the Democrats retake control of the state Senate and the people who fled Wisconsin to stop the governor from acting, our state senators left the state to stand in solidarity with labor, will now be in charge of a branch of state government. Their power, their ability to check and balance the governor uh, will not solve all our problems. And they're Democrats, after all. They're hardly perfect. But, <laughs> but it will introduce that che system of checks and balances. It's a really big deal. And I want to tell you something. I'll close off with this. The reason you support them through, there's a ton of groups that are working. Um, labor organizations, Democracy for America has been terrific. Uh, PDA has been engaged. Other groups are engaged. And I say, find your route in. But here's why you should care about Wisconsin. I love it. It's my state, so take that with a grain of salt. But here's why you should care about Wisconsin. If we change control of our state Senate and we begin to check and balance a radical Republican governor, that will create the opening and the inspiration to begin in November, when, we're, when it's possible to do, to begin the process of recalling Governor Walker and removing from office, not at the end of his term, not on his schedule, but on the people's schedule, a governor 
who went out and attacked labor rights and cut $1.6 billion from public education and public services. Now you think, well, how could you get the, it, cut, it takes 540,000 signatures. Well, in Ohio, where Governor Kasich attacked labor rights, the people of Ohio at the start of this month filed 1.3 million signatures to overturn their anti-labor law via a referendum. <laughs> Ohio's a bigger state. Ohio's a bigger state. But Wisconsinites speak now, a beginning in November, and gathering one million signatures, one million signatures to force a recall of Governor Walker next spring. And if they succeed, and I believe they will, I've covered politics for a long time. I've been amazed by everything that's happened, but now I've ceased to be amazed, I start to believe. And what I will tell you is, Governor Walker will face a pretty good opponent. Because if they file a million signatures, former Senator Russ Feingold will step up and challenge Scott Walker. And in the polling right now, Russ Feingold beats Scott Walker by 15 points. And if Russ Feingold, if, if the penalty for attacking the rights of working families is to be not just removed from office, but to be removed and replaced by US Senator Russ Feingold, now the governor of an American state, the most progressive guy who served in the Senate, along with our friend Bernie Sanders, if that happens, the message that will go out from Wisconsin will resonate far beyond the borders of this little state in the, on the Canadian border or on the Lake Superior border. People across this country will recognize that we don't have to live our political lives as they are defined by the media and the political class. We can seize control of the process. We can use the recall. We can use the street. We can use every tool available of, to us to stand up for the rights of working people, working families, and our communities. And if we do so, if we do so, I'll promise you something. We will grow a spine in Barack Obama's back. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>